Hello and welcome to day two of Hope Hispanos Organized for Political Equality's 27th Annual Latina Action Day. My name is Sandra Magana Cuellar. I am the co-chair of this year's Latina Action Day along with Celinda Vasquez, who you heard from yesterday. I'm also the Director of Government Affairs for Charter Communications, a leading connectivity company providing broadband voice, video, mobile services to more than 5.1 million Californians under the brand name Spectrum. I'm excited to join you today as part of Latina Action Day. I have a long history with HOPE, having served as the, as the organization's administrator over 20 years ago and being named an honorary HOPE Leadership Institute alumna. I go way back to the early days of Latina Action Day when we would gather at the Capitol and visit our legislators. At the time, this event was completely unprecedented. Hundreds of Latinas marching over to the state capitol advocating for economic and political parity for our communities. Today, Latina Action Day is a well-known and anticipated event. <clears throat> Although we are learning and advocating at a distance, we continue to have an impact to drive important conversations in Sacramento. So thank you for being here and for making your voices heard. Now, yesterday we dove into what an inclusive economic recovery from the pandemic looks like, and we took part in a virtual advocacy action. Thank you to everyone who joined us in writing letters and calling your senators. Over 200 of you made your voices heard. Quite amazing, thank you. And today we'll get into another essential topic for our communities, the topic of education. When COVID-19 hit, it challenged the foundations of social and economic norms around the world. Virtually overnight, much of our daily experience, jobs, healthcare, education, civics, and connection to our family and friends shifted online. As the center point of this new normal, internet infrastructure that was once an afterthought took a new prominence. This was especially significant with regard to education and having to turn to distance learning. Distance learning has exposed the deep inequities of the educational system for English language learners, low income and Latino students, and in general has been an uneven experience for students across the state based on geography and resources. Charter has been part of keeping America connected during this challenging time. And despite a surge in demand for our data services, Charter's, Charter's robust broadband network has performed extremely well and has been supporting the work from home economy, remote education, telehealth, and many other services. Early last year, to help with distance learning, we offered Spectrum Internet for free for 60 days to households with students or educators who did not already have Spectrum Internet. And through that program, we connected over 450,000 families. In addition to supporting distance learning, we made efforts to keep Americans connected. We suspended collection activities and did not terminate services for residential or small and medium businesses experiencing COVID-related economic hardships. Through this program, the Keep America Connected program, we helped approximately 700,000 customers. We temporarily opened our Wi-Fi access points across our footprint for public use, and we rapidly connected and upgraded fiber services to healthcare providers. Charter is committed to being part of the comprehensive solution needed to bridge the digital divide. Closing that remaining gap will require both public and private investments. Charter is working hard with both state and local government officials on legislative efforts that would immediately, immediately expand digital inclusion for low-income public housing residents, efforts to connect low-income K through 12 students, and efforts around expanding broadband infrastructure to connect unserved households. Access to broadband is just one element to the challenges we face in education. With today's conversation, we hope to shed light on educational disparities and discuss lasting solutions to the challenges faced by learners and educators alike and learn how we can get involved and make a difference. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Please use the Q&A box to ask our panelists questions. We will get to as many questions as possible at the end of the panel. 
you can use the chat box to communicate with HOPE staff and with fellow participants. We would love to hear your name and title and the city you are tuning in from. You can access supplemental materials for today's session by visiting HOPE's website via the link being dropped in the chat box right now. Today's program will go until about 10.45 and a, a recording will be available on HOPE's Facebook page and website after the event so you can reference the webinar in the future. And be sure to join us tomorrow for our final Latina Action Day session. It's all about powering up Latina representation. You won't want to miss it. To get us in the education mindset now, I'm excited to welcome HOPE Policy Director Vanessa Spagnoli. Vanessa is going to review some key data on how Latinas are faring in education, and she will give us a preview of some of the other education bills we will be advocating on at the end of the session. Welcome, Vanessa. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, it's been so great working with you at Latina Action Day. Um, really appreciate all of your time and um, support for Latina Action Day. Good morning, Latina Action Day advocates. My name is Vanessa Spagnoli. I serve HOPE as the policy director, and I am thrilled to be here to uplift the state of Latina education. Rooted in research completed by Dr. Elsa Macias on behalf of HOPE, I will be presenting a brief landscape of California's K through 12 education system. This body of research can be found in HOPE's third installment of the Economic Status of Latinas report, which was made possible by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who is here today. This iteration of the report analyzes how increasing opportunity in education is key to addressing barriers in economic prosperity. So let's get into it. The first thing this audience should know about the state of Latina education in California is that our community is strongly represented in the public school system. In fact, Latino students are 55% of all students enrolled in public schools, and in some places, the percentage is higher, as you can see on this screen. In Fresno, in Fresno, Latino students comprise 65%, and in Riverside, where I grew up, Latino students comprise 63 of the student population. Yet for many of our students, the opportunity gap is real and plagues the pathway to opportunity in very real ways. The opportunity gap refers to the conditions and barriers that students face throughout their educational careers that are inherent to the systems that disadvantage specific communities. Top of mind for many of us is how COVID-19 exposed the deep inequities that already existed in education. The images of students at talk, in the Taco Bell parking lot and the headlines around distance learning were loud in all of our hearts and minds. Headlines like this one, Latino students fell behind nine months to a full academic year in 2019-2020 school year. Some of the contributing factors included underfunded schools, unprepared for remote learning, less support for English learn language learners and their Spanish speaking parents, and less access to the internet and appropriate devices. The second thing to know about California's K through 12 education system is that in 2013, the local control funding formula dramatically altered public school funding. In nature, LCFF is intended to be a holistic and equitable funding formula that provides additional resources to schools after their base funding. LCFF shifted what schools what school districts reported on in terms of accountability. On this slide, you will see the performance outcomes that school districts report on. These are captured as one, conditions of learning, two, student outcomes, three, engagement. In addition to the new accountability structure, LCFF also identified three student subgroups that include foster youth, low-income students, and English language learner students. Those three subgroups have been identified as special groups whose education required additional resources and supports. In HOPE's report, The Economic Status of Latinas, 
we make a finding that Latino students are the largest share of each of those subgroups. That includes 71% of low income students are Latino, 55% of foster youth are Latino, and the primary language of 81% of English language learners is Spanish. I say this to underscore the point that if Latino students are supported, then outcomes across the board rise. Looking deeper into this data, LCFF has been implemented, some progress has been made. For example, between 2013 and 2017, the rate of A through G completion rose from 29% to 39%. This 10 point gain is impressive, yet that is not even half of Latino students who completed college readiness courses. This is important to note. It is also important to note that college enrollment rates for Latinas trail their white female student counterparts by 10%. In California, the high school graduation rate is at 85%, yet for Latinas who are English learners, it is only at 71%. For Latina foster youth, only 61% graduate. There is more work to be done to say the very least. Today, we have an incredible panel of system leaders of California's education system to hear their thoughts, their priorities, and their best thinkings about how we can support Latino students across the state. And after that, we will have an opportunity to take collective action to advocate for two bills, SB 309 and AB 1456, that are slated to create positive impact for the education space for Latina students. Please stick around because your voice is so critical to this conversation. Thank you again. It is now my pleasure to introduce a fearless Latina doing incredible work in the state Senate, Senator Lena Gonzalez. As state Senator, she represents nearly 1 million residents in Southeast Los Angeles, portions of South LA and Lakewood, and her hometown of Long Beach. She is also a proud HLI alumna class of 2013. Let's hear from Senator Lena Gonzalez. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm State Senator Lena Gonzalez, proudly representing Southeast Los Angeles and my hometown, the city of Long Beach. It's an honor to be here with you all this morning and happy annual Latina Action Day. It's one of my favorite days of the year. Thank you to Hope for organizing this virtual public policy conference and for addressing the state of California's education. Many of you will learn today from education experts on how distance learning has affected language learners, low income and Latino students inequitably across California. COVID-19, as we know, has exacerbated existing inequities across a range of social structures, including our nation's education system. Our communities and families have experienced physical, emotional health and financial strains. In particular, the digital divide has long resulted in deep inequity for for low-income Californians, rural urban families, and minorities throughout the state. With students learning remotely, we witnessed that students without adequate internet would visit a neighbor's home, fast food restaurants like the two little girls in Salinas at a Taco Bell parking lot, a park, or a Wi-Fi bus to access the internet to do their homework, or having to take turns with their siblings to access Wi-Fi because the connection is too slow. According to Pew Research Center, about 23% of Latino students live in homes with no high-speed internet. The lack of adequate internet service is an urgent matter of education that necessitates bold legislative action at all levels of government. In response, one of the policies that I'm championing this year is SB4, the Broadband for All Act. Just this past week, SB4 Broadband for All Act passed out of the Senate Energy Utilities and Communications Committee. Broadband for All has proved itself to be a necessity during this pandemic, and I'm hopeful that we can close the digital divide and continue to support student learning here in our state of California. We cannot continue to call ourselves the fifth largest economy in the world and still have thousands of families left behind without access to adequate internet, especially our Latino families that need it the most. I look forward to working with community and state leadership in ensuring that our schools reopen safely, and I look forward to working with everyone in closing the digital divide in the state and in Senate District 33. Schools are vital to our state's economy, and they are a central part of our communities, and they are a lifeline for California students and families, and broadband for all needs to, act, to pass now. 
I want to thank Hope and all of the Latino stakeholders that are here today, especially the Latinas that are fighting for these very issues. Thank you so much for having me today. Enjoy Latina Action History Day. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me and see me. I wish I could see all of you. Thank you so much for joining us for the second Latina Action Day. Yesterday was such an informative day around our economy recovery. And then today, of course, front and center is the state of education. A big thank you to our dear friend, Senator Lena Gonzalez for always making time and for her remarks today regarding the digital divide and the need to address education in, in such a succinct way. So thank you so much, Senator. And a big thank you to our co-chair, Celinda Vasquez and Sandra Magana. Sandra did a great job, Sandra Magana Cuellar. Um, I remember those early days of Latina Action Day, probably a lot of you uh, also do. And to po Hope's Policy Director, Vanessa Spengali, incredible leadership in ensuring that we all have that basic knowledge of how Latinas are faring. Of course, a lot of that information is gonna change because of the pandemic. And that's why our conversation today is so important. If you don't know already, my name is Helen Torres. I'm the CEO of HOPE, a proud CEO of a great organization. I'm hoping you're enjoying your, our conference so far and are ready to continue deepening in your understanding of the challenges our communities face so that we can take action to rebuild and eventually recover from the devastation this pandemic has caused us. As Vanessa Spengali has already mentioned, just talked about, education is an issue central to HOPE's mission of ensuring political and economic parity for Latinas. Addressing unequal education outcomes that Latina students face due to structural inequalities is central to improving the economic standing of Latinas overall. And we all know that when Latinas thrive, California's economy benefits and our communities are uplifted. We're proud to call the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as a supporter and partner in this work to close educational opportunity gaps. And we are pleased to be joined today by our good friend, Max Espinoza, Espinoza Senior Program Officer with the Gates Foundation. And we're pleased to have him not only here today to give us some of his remarks to moderate, but also moderate our panel conversation. Mac's work at the foundation focuses on building the political and public will for education reforms that close opportunity and equity gaps in states across the United States. Max currently leads the foundation's policy and advocacy efforts specifically here in California. With that, please a big warm welcome for Max Espinosa, our moderator and special friend from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Welcome Max. Thank you, Helen, and uh, it's good to be with Hope um, on Latina Action Day, um, even if we're having to do it virtual, uh, hopefully for, for the last time as we come out of this pandemic. Um, just wanna thank uh, Helen and the, the board of directors of Hope and the staff who have worked really hard on this event. Um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a proud uh, supporter of Hope, and uh, we believe that Hope's role to ensure political and economic parity for Latinas through leadership, advocacy, and education is critical um, even more now than ever. And uh, Latina Action Day was actually the first time I was introduced to Hope um, when I was a legislative staffer in the capital of California. And uh, um, it was immediately clear that this is an organization to be taken seriously. So um, thank you, Hope, for everything you do. Today we have the opportunity to um, talk about the impacts of the pandemic on um, education and, and Latinas and Latinos in the state of California and what, um, what is being done and what can be done to ensure that um, persistent opportunity gaps in education and, and inequities um, uh, do not get worse. Um, and we're really uh, excited and um, honored to have uh, two of the state's most important leaders uh, on these issues who are um, literally have uh, the decision-making role um, to help impact um, how the state responds uh, to, to these crises. Um, and just to review, um, obviously the United States and the world is in the throes of two pandemics. Um, a biological one caused by the coronavirus um, 
and a historical, social, and ongoing pandemic that's connected to systemic racism. The COVID-19 pandemic has severely impacted Latinas and Latinos disproportionately exacerbating inequities across multiple sectors of our society. Throughout the pandemic, Latinas and Latinos have been more likely to be infected with the COVID-19 uh, virus and to die from it of any other group. Multiple factors have contributed to this phenomenon, including Latinas and Latinos significant representation as essential workers, living in high density housing situations in some cases, being less likely to seek medical care and, and having lower levels of vaccinations than their white counterparts. Latinas and Latinos have also been more likely than their white counterparts to lose employment and see their earnings decrease during the pandemic, in part given their concentration in some of the most hard hit industries, tourism, hospitality, retail, food, et cetera. As a result, a significant number of Latinas and Latinos are also food and housing insecure. Undocumented immigrants within our community have also faced limited access to public assistance programs due to state and federal laws limiting their participation. The multiple impacts of the pandemic on Latinas and Latinos, and by extension, Latina and Latino families, has increased anxiety and emotional distress in our community. Education is one of the places where there's an opportunity to support the current generation and the future generation. But today I just want to briefly mention our two guests that will be with us um, for this panel. And that includes um, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond and State Superintendent Tony Thurman. Uh, the panel today will focus um, on education and the state of education in California. Okay. I'm going to ask actually our two panelists um, as they join, talk a little bit about their role and, and who they are, um, you know, what they do, uh, particularly because not everybody that's here today knows um, the different roles that everyone plays in the educational system. And the first person to join us today is uh, Linda Darling Hammond. And before I, I turn it over to, to Dr. Darling Hammond, I just want to mention that she's a professor emeritus at Stanford University, um, one of the best universities in the world here in California. And um, she's the founder of the Learning Policy Institute, which she is president and CEO. Um, I could go on and on about Darling Hammond, uh, her accolades and um, record is long and distinguished. Um, but let me just say this. Um, uh, Dr. Darling Hammond is uh, one of those individuals that people around the country uh, to ask uh, her point of view on uh, what to do. Um, and that's been true today as it was um, uh, for many years. Um, she helped President Barack Obama when he was putting together his education policy during the transition into his presidency. And she served a similar role for our now President Biden. Um, and Governor Gavin Newsom appointed her as one of his first actions um, to be the president of the State Board of Education, a critical role in shaping and shepherding the state's education agenda. Um, so with that, I'd love to um, welcome Dr. Darling Hammond and just ask for our hope uh, audience if, if she could also say a little bit about the role and um, you know, how she's sort of come at these issues. Um, um, she may not have, Dr. Darling Hammond, I, I'm sure you did not predict that you would be dealing with all these issues when you first joined. So it would be interesting to hear as you're doing your intro, um, what you kind of came in thinking you were gonna do and sort of how you've had to uh, pivot um, and to see as, as the, the priorities. And then we'll dig in a little more. Dr. Darling Hammond. Thank you. Great to see you, Max. And it's really wonderful to be here. What a terrific uh, event to be asked to be part of. Uh, this is very inspiring to me. Uh, and so I'll say a little bit about what the State Board of Education does, what I thought we'd be working on when I came in, and of course, how we've you know uh, pivoted during the pandemic in collaboration 
with the state superintendent and the California Department of Education. We work hand in glove. The state board of education is appointed by the governor and the um, president of the state board, you know, works with the governor on a variety of education topics. Uh, in addition to those that are taken up by the state board itself, uh, those include especially things around curriculum uh, and um, accountability and assessments, uh, the shape of education, what it is that the content of the educational system is. Uh, we are not responsible for uh, funding. I often get those questions, uh, but that is the legislature's role. And you've just heard from a wonderful member of the legislature who is taking on an issue that is very important to us, the broadband for all issue is a huge issue that has come up uh, during the pandemic and is one of the things that both Superintendent Thurman and myself and the governor and the first partner have all been working on to try to immediately address you know, the needs that came about uh, for broadband and during the pandemic. So as we um, sort of launched the administration, uh, the governor had a whole set of things on his agenda around early childhood education and a master plan for early childhood has just come out, and that will be very important in all communities in the state, uh, especially uh, the Latina community. Uh, the um, work around uh, getting our curriculum focused on 21st century skills, uh, keeping the accountability system moving forward in a way that uh, identifies equity issues uh, and how we can address them more productively, and then of course, when the pandemic hit, uh, we had to really think uh, deeply about how to address the enormous set of equity issues that were made even more prominent uh, by the pandemic. Max, thank you for that wonderful framing, because I think you really helped us think about the, the ways in which uh, the, both the uh, public health crisis and the economic crisis that has accompanied it, which has affected uh, black and brown communities much more intensely uh, than others in the state. And of course, the issues of systemic racism that undergird so much in the education system uh, and in the system of um, the society as a whole. So we've been working very hard on immediately when the pandemic hit, uh, being sure that there would be an expectation for distance learning. Not every state did that. Uh, and then, of course, we knew that there was a huge digital divide. About a third of kids in California did not have devices and connectivity to allow them to engage digitally in school. Uh, and that was particularly true in the Latinx community. We began by you know, trying to get uh, resources from corporations, businesses, the legislature to begin to address that. Uh, we were able, uh, because of the work that um, we do as well with the federal government, to get funding coming in for that. Uh, but we have a long way yet to go in terms of broadband access for all. It's not just about the devices. Uh, I don't know if, how many of you saw that very uh, iconic photo of, I think it was two little girls. Uh, they, you know, they, they were in uh, parkas, so it was not easy to tell entirely. But it looked like two little girls outside of uh, Taco Bell trying to get Wi-Fi uh, so that they could do their homework. We've made a lot of progress on this agenda. We've probably cut the digital divide in California by uh, about two thirds, but we still have a long way to go and we have to sustain those gains. And then of course, we've worked hard to try to get teachers uh, trained up to do online learning to help districts uh, get the uh, uh, situation in place uh, where they could bring small groups of learners back, even when it wasn't possible to bring everyone back, including a priority on English learners, as well as students with a variety of other needs. Uh, and we've, of course, been working to get schools open, which is finally beginning to happen in a large way across the state. Um, and uh, we are looking forward to being back fully uh, in person by fall, but substantially. Uh, in the meantime, we're focusing now a lot on what can we do with the summer. Summer should not be lost learning time. We should build on where we are now. And so in terms of the federal money that's coming in, in terms of the state guidance that's being offered, we're really focused on how districts can offer enriching, exciting, engaging 
learning opportunities for kids during the summer in anticipation of getting back on track in the fall. And I'll um, punt it back to you, Max, because I could stand on this soapbox for a little while, but you may have other questions you want to get to. No, that's that's wonderful. Thank you for, for laying that out, Dr. Darlingham. <laughs> um, one of the things that um, I, I'm wanting to ask you about to share with the audience is um, sort of what, what has surprised you the most um, in terms of the inequities that um, that have come come to the fore, um, uh, given your your many years um, looking at these issues and, and trying to address them, uh, what has stood out to you as something that um, really needs to, to to be focused on um, as we begin to come out of the pandemic? And and maybe related to that, um, Dr. Darling Hemmen, um, people have talked about um, learning loss, which uh, I know is not a, a great way to describe what's what's happened with students. Um, um, some people have talked about learning recovery. Um, uh, others have, have also talked about the missing students. Um, and we know during the pandemic, a lot of students were just disappeared, right, from our, our K-12 system, um, and also our higher education system in some cases. Um, so what, what what's, has surprised you the most and, and sort of keeps you up at night right now in terms of as you're thinking about um, what what we need to do um, in certain areas to, to deal with things like learning recovery and other other matters? Yeah. Um, you know, I wish I could say I were surprised. Um, I've been in this business for a long time. So unfortunately, I'm less surprised and more worried. There are a lot of things that keep me up at night. California is a state that for a long time disinvested in its public education system. Uh, you might remember back in, I guess it was 79, Prop 13 uh, came about and that caused a reduction in funding to public schools for a long time, which created a more and more inequitable system. Uh, and the communities that served most students of color were the ones that were uh, less well-funded. So that got turned around um, to some extent uh, with Governor Jerry Brown, 2013, the local control funding formula. We heard about the LCFF earlier, and we have been trying to put more money in a more equitable way into the system, and we're gradually making progress. But California still has a long way to go. We spend much less than states like Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, uh, Massachusetts that, uh, achieve at higher levels. We have a high cost of living and we have a very high need student population. Uh, so we have to make more progress. We have to get that money out to schools in a more equitable way. And there are three things that really keep me up at night as I think about our next steps. I wanna acknowledge all the progress we've made, which is showing up in stronger achievement and uh, closing the gap for uh, Latinx populations in the state. It is, you know, um, a, a process that's going to take a little while. Uh, but one thing we have is um, a high poverty student population. About 60% of students in California are what they say eligible for free and reduced price lunch, which means they uh, live in families that are um, below 200% of the poverty line. Uh, there's a huge housing problem. Uh, many, many kids are experiencing um, homelessness which ranges from couch surfing to motels to shelters, and that's been getting worse during the pandemic. We've got uneven uh, health care uh, and food security for young people, uh, and all of that has gotten worse, and it's gotten the worst, as you know, for uh, the populations we're most concerned about. And so uh, we need to make a major effort to get the wraparound services to schools that provide health and mental health care and before and after school care. Because parents, so many of them have to be working. Um, we need sort of seven to seven care. That's a dream that we have uh, to advance uh, for our schools so that kids are able to get fed and supported and enabled to do um, enriching activities after school and homework, as well as during the school day and get the things that they need to be able to step up and that their families need in order to be able to have a stable life. So that's number one, and we are making progress on community schools and other wraparound strategies. Second thing, in addition to the digital divide, uh, which I'm glad we're talking about, is the uh, need for teachers. 
uh, and in particular, the need to recruit and retain teachers of color. Uh, we have a teacher shortage in California. It's been getting worse since 2015. Uh, we need to bring teachers into the profession uh, in a way that allows them to do so without going into debt because teaching is a profession that pays less than many other professions with similar education. So we're um, mounting some strategies to get, get that pipeline. We want that pipeline to be a diverse pipeline because we know that students in fact um, have uh, students of color have achievement gains from teachers of color and we need a diverse teaching course uh, and one that is linguistically uh, diverse as well as um, racially and ethnically uh, uh, diverse and in other ways as well. So we're gonna need to deal with that shortage. We're gonna need to deal with the digital divide. We're gonna need to deal with those wraparound services as we bring kids back. And then we wanna do it in a way that's positive, that focuses on accelerating learning rather than labeling kids as behind, deficient, or um, having lost learning. Kids are always learning. They may not have been learning the traditional school curriculum, but they've been learning how to take care of their siblings, how to uh, contribute to the family you know, process that's been going on. Uh, so we wanna help kids get the kind of uh, intensive support, small group instruction, tutoring and other enablers to recover in learning without uh, a deficit perspective on learning loss. And I see that Tony is here, so I want you to get him into the conversation. It's great to see you. Thank you, Dr. I mean, really appreciate you laying that out for everybody. You gave us a lot, you've given us a lot to really process and think about and um, clearly thought through a lot of these issues. Um, we're now um, joined, uh, the perfect timing, uh, by the state of California State uh, Superintendent for Public Instruction, uh, Tony Thurman. Um, and uh, just to say a few words as I, um, I hand it off to you, Superintendent Thurman. Um, we just got started with a, a conversation around the pandemic and its impact on education. And um, Superintendent Thurman uh, you know, knows resilience and struggle himself personally. Um, coming from our, our public school systems as a child and, and going to public schools. Um, he's been a champion in the social work area and as a school, school parent. Um, he has been a state representative um, representing the, the communities of Richmond and the surrounding areas in the state legislature and, and now has uh, the huge task of being um, in partnership with Dr. Darwin Hammond, um, the state's public K-12 system. Um, Superintendent Thurman also has a role in our higher education system as a member of the Board of Trustees for the California State University and a regent for the University of California. Um, so with that, I, I'm gonna actually um, ask Superintendent Thurman, uh, first welcome you. Um, thank, you. thank you for being with us. One of the questions we asked out, out the gate for Dr. Thurman was a lot of our guests um, uh, may not know all the details of who runs California, how it all works. And so we'd love for you to just briefly explain your role just a, briefly. And, um, and also um, as you do that, um, I know when you ran for office, you didn't know there was gonna be a global pandemic. Uh, and so I'm sure you had a set of priorities um, and, and the pandemic has, has made us all sort of have to look at those again and, and figure out what those are. So we'd love to hear your thoughts about how that shifted for you and, and what you see and then we'll continue with our discussion. Well, thank you, Max. Uh, buenos dias, Max. Buenos dias, Dr. Lena Darling-Hammond and to everyone in the Hope family. Uh, it's an honor to be with you. I'm coming to you today from the California School for the Deaf in Riverside. Uh, it is one of the schools managed by the California Department of Education. Uh, a little is known, we manage three schools as opposed to the 10,000 schools that exist in the state of California. I'll say more about that, but first just wanna let you know, today is an honor for me to literally come from welcoming back uh, our elementary school students. 80% of our students are back on campus. Today's their first day, we're greeting them. Um, uh, uh, Latinas, Latinos, African-American students, students of all backgrounds. And we're so grateful to be able to have our students uh, back on campus. Um, 
uh, at the California Department of Education, uh, we are able to support 10,000 schools, but our, all of our districts are organized into a local control way where there is an individual school board um, that manages 1,000 plus school districts. For I know that many of you have visited me when I was in the state legislature and many of you are interested in being involved in politics. Many of you may consider running to serve on the school boards of one of those thousand school uh, uh, districts that make local policies. Uh, the California Department of Education and the State Board of Education work together to provide guidance and regulations that districts use for implementing laws that get passed by the state legislature. Uh, in my role, I get to work with the governor um, and the legislature to get resources uh, to our schools. They need financial resources. California, sadly, is still 37th in the nation in per pupil spending. That's pre-pandemic. Our challenges before the pandemic, I think, are still the same challenges even post-pandemic, and that is closing the opportunity gap. That was my number one priority coming into this office. It's true, Max. No one could have expected uh, to have been impacted uh, by uh, a pandemic in this way. Uh, but what we've done in the pandemic is make our focus um, uh, a few, you know, a few priorities. One, helping all of our families to get access to vaccines. Uh, we put on uh, webinars on how to educate and provide information about the importance of vaccines in the, Lat in the Latinx community, because we know some people are concerned. And we know that a lot of us get our information word of mouth. And so we had Gloria Suerta and a number of, uh, you know, Senator Padilla and many others to help promote um, the importance of the vaccine. We know that in the Latinx community, in the African-American community, uh, we are impacted at a much higher rate um, as it relates to uh, infection and illness and death um, from COVID. So it's very important that we've had these conversations about vaccines as a strategy to help our students return to school. We've also focused on providing rapid COVID tests to all of our schools. We've secured uh, more than 5 million free rapid COVID tests. That means people get their results in 15 minutes. So if someone's asymptomatic and positive, they can quarantine while you keep the rest of the school community safe. And so our focus has been on safety, helping our districts think through the safety questions. Uh, we care deeply about the things that Dr. Linda Darling Hammond talked about, how do you offset learning gaps with, with tutoring and professional development uh, for our schools and summer programs? These are, these are all parts of the, uh, the menu of what will be important for helping our students as they return to school. But we have to address their mental health needs as well, the social, emotional well-being of our students. Um, you know, I'm trained as a social worker, so I always talk about the importance of well-being for our students. We're working on proposals both at the state and the federal level to really ramp up the amount of mental health services we can provide for our students and for our educators. I know that Dr. Linda Darling Hammond talked to you about how we want to diversify our, our teacher workforce. I hope that many of you are considering a career uh, as an educator. There are opportunities, there are scholarships, there are supports. We're sp supporting legislation as we speak that would make it easier for someone to become an educator and in particular, educators of color. And so we hope that you all will consider that in addition to that, I would just say that we've tried to focus on addressing the pandemic of racism. Uh, what an intense year this has been, from the killing of George Floyd to watching the surge of acts of hate against our Asian American Pacific Islander community, watching acts of hate against immigrants, uh, watching children um, you know, who need support in, on our borders. You know, how do we support them? We have really incorporated all of these concerns into what we do in our schools. We've led a campaign called Education to End Hate so that we can address the kind of hate that we know that many experience, um, literally sending grants to our school districts to provide uh, professional development to help offset that. And of course, many of you know, we passed a model ethnic studies curriculum guide to help our school districts. We, our students have told us they want to learn about the contributions of their ancestors. They wanna look in their textbooks and see people who look like them. And so we passed this model ethnic studies curriculum guide so that students and educators can really talk about the contributions of African-Americans, the Latinx community, Asian Pacific Islanders and Native Americans and the contributions that they've made to make this a great state. And so um, I'll, I'll leave it there, Max. I'm happy to take questions, but we've tried to think about our response as closing the opportunity gap, response to health and safety in the pandemic and addressing issues around racism and bias, uh, which we believe is a pandemic of itself. 
Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Superintendent Thurman. Um, it was a great, uh, you, you're right where you, you just caught right up to our conversations, it was perfect. Um, um, I, this is supposed to be a conversation, so I just want you to both feel like you can jump in and, and, and um, add to or, or um, uh, uh, contribute to the conversation. Um, it's so rare to have the three of you together, the three of us together, so this is really cool. Uh, and uh, I just wanna say how fortunate it, clearly we are to have you in, in your roles um, in, in the state of California. Um, you clearly both are, are um, demonstrating um, how committed you are to dealing with all these very challenging issues. Um, one of the things, this is gonna sound a little counterintuitive, but we have heard you know, bright spots here and there um, during the pandemic and um, in education. And um, as much as there's been a lot of bad news um, uh, um, in terms of equity and other issues of that, that nature, um, given where we are right now, are there, are there things that you have seen or that you've heard about that you think we need to think about going forward um, as, as things we keep? You know, there's this whole conversation of what stays, what, what, what do we wanna go back to what we were before, right? Um, or evolutions that, that may come out of this, um, this uh, world pandemic uh, with regard to education. Um, so just curious to, to hear both of your thoughts on that as you're grappling with all these immediate issues. Maybe we'll start with Dr. Darling Hammond and, and turn to Superintendent Thurman. Um, could you maybe zero me in a little bit because that's such a broad question. Yeah. Uh, where would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so, you know, in higher education, for example, there's, there's conversations about, you know, you know, should there be hybrid options for, for students, you know, uh, types of certain types of learners. Mm -hmm. Obviously, 12 students may not be exactly the same as, as uh, older students um, uh, in terms of their development and, uh, and the rest. But, um, you know, are there things that, that, that you think we need to think about, um, the innovations that you've seen or heard mm -hmm. about, um, either in California or around the country that, as you've been grappling with all these issues? Yeah. Um, well, you know, just to start with the hybrid uh, point that you made, uh, you know, we have learned a lot about what to do with technology in ways that can actually improve learning. And so while it's gonna be very important to get kids back to school in person and particularly the littlest kids, um, you know, who um, really need that, uh, you know, warm wraparound uh, group support, some kids uh, are learning well uh, and in, in, actually some are learning better online because it suits their frame of, of uh, reference and learning. Uh, and we've learned some things about how to use technology productively. So number one, I hope that we preserve those technology uh, innovations as we come back to the classroom and use technologies much more productively. We've seen uh, lots of ways in which uh, some of the interactive technology tools have been extremely valuable, uh, ways in which teachers have been able to put kids into different kinds of uh, spaces and groups and uh, learning opportunities. So I think we need to do that. Uh, there will be some opportunities for some people to stay online. There are kids and families who are saying, we actually find that this is working well for us and will encourage schools that want to do so to be able to have a variability in the way in which kids uh, connect with schooling. Um, we see actually in the data on um, the learning uh, progress of kids that uh, some of the high school kids are doing better in math uh, online than they were doing in the classroom. I'm not sure which uh, computer programs and software may be partly responsible for that, but we want to figure that out and use that innovation. Another innovation is the use of time. Uh, you know, we in the United States have teachers working about eight hours per week more in the classroom with kids than teachers in other countries who have that eight hours a week for collaboration time and planning time and other things that allow teachers to do their best work for kids. Well, uh, our factory model system had not gotten us to that place yet, but we see a lot of districts that have now used time in new ways with synchronous and asynchronous learning and with the involvement of other community organizations to uh, engage kids in different kinds of activities, they're finding time for teachers 
to plan and learn and work together, which improves their practice, which gives them enough breathing room to be their best selves in the classroom. I hope we can you know, in include that kind of an innovation in what we preserve. We've seen some really good connections between schools and families um, where you know, just to keep kids you know, um, online and engaged, they make sure that the needs are being met. There's been one-on-one -on -one work with families for special education uh, teachers and for uh, students who are learning English. I hope we can preserve those family connections in new ways. Uh, so there's a lot that we've gained. And of course, we've made progress in closing the digital divide. We cannot afford to go backwards. We need to be uh, coming through the pandemic. There's money coming from the state, uh, from the federal government in a way that allows every kid to have a workable computing device and connectivity uh, every day, every year, after school as well as during school, so that that um, you know, progress that we've made is preserved. That's great. So, 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 I'd like to take a crack at that question. Uh, you know, I would just echo some of the things that Dr. Darling Hammond said, that this is an opportunity for us to think about the things that weren't working for our students before the pandemic. And one example is high stakes testing. You know, high stakes testing has always been rife with bias. Uh, and, and this is an opportunity for us to think differently about how we measure learning. And I don't think that putting all of it into one test is the answer. I know a lot of uh, the whole panel uh, uh, attendees have been asking about testing as it relates to those who want to enter the teaching field. And this is an, a great example of a place where we need to rethink, remove tests that have been barriers to create opportunities for those who would like to teach in our communities. Uh, you know, on the computing devices, you know, the pandemic uncovered that um, California, sadly, with all of our resources, uh, we have allowed as a state and as a nation, the digital divide uh, to continue. If you look at the impact of the, uh, of the learning gaps during the pandemic, I, I, su I submit to you a lot of that has to do with the fact that we had a million students when we started who didn't have a computing device, and we still may have a million students who don't have access to the internet. As Dr. Darling Hammond has said, the state and the federal government have given lots of money and districts have purchased hundreds of thousands of devices. And uh, Lynn and I have worked together to sort of get donations to supplement that. But we have parts of the state that don't have any um, of the, uh, the technology that is needed to have broadband. And so um, there are measures that we're supporting in the legislature that would provide broadband for all. We've raised a million dollars to supplement that with an innovation challenge. If there's an entrepreneur here in the Hope family uh, who has a, a, a groundbreaking solution for how to close the digital divide, there's a chance for you to win this million dollar prize. Just go to innovation at cde.ca.gov. We wanna hear from you. Um, and, and finally, we're pursuing using SpaceX technology, satellite technology to provide um, the internet now for those places that don't have the infrastructure for broadband, uh, because not just as a way to respond to the pandemic, we have to be preparing our students for the jobs of tomorrow. Uh, and that means they have to have access to technology, um, high-speed internet with no data caps. They have to be able to have access to digital literacy for our multilingual learner families. We have to provide them with support. And, and, and I submit to you that our students need to have connections to career pathways but that we should do it through paid internships. You know, I, I'll just say, you know, growing up, you know, raised by a single mom, my mom was an immigrant from Panama and she worked as a nurse's aide and we struggled. We never had enough. I was always looking for a way to earn. What if we gave our students a chance to earn and learn and do it in a way that what they, what they earn goes back into our local, you know, communities and our local economies. And so um, we believe that in spite of the challenges we're facing during the pandemic, this is a watershed moment for us to think differently about how students learn, how we prepare them for the future, give them a chance to learn another language, give them a chance to get hands-on and practical skills, give them a chance to learn about civics and their responsibilities to their community. And, and I would submit that right now, create a connection to career pathways through paid internships um, to help support our students along the journey. And if I could just uh, add on to that, uh, obviously plus one, it's a wonderful vision. We have lots of um, new opportunities to begin to build in the direction that the superintendent is talking about. 
We have $23 billion coming into California from the federal government as part of the American Rescue Plan Act. And uh, it does allow for a number of these kind of recovery steps. I know there are people in the audience who I'm seeing in the chat who are interested in teaching. So I also just wanna add on to what the superintendent said about ways to reduce the barriers to teaching. So we do have in the um, uh, trailer bill in the proposed budget this year, um, money for uh, service scholarships for those who will go into teaching in high need schools and high need subject areas, 20 up to $20,000 in a service scholarship for that purpose. We have teacher residency supports. Many uh, districts now have residencies where you can uh, uh, apply to get your credential while you are under the wing of a, an expert teacher in the district learning to teach, uh, have your tuition uh, paid for and a stipend uh, while you're doing that. And then you commit to teaching in that district, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Fresno. Many districts are now putting these residency models in place. We have a, a bill that is uh, hopefully gonna get enacted that will uh, allow people to use coursework in lieu of tests to demonstrate their basic skills and subject matter knowledge uh, and uh, be able to move into the um, teaching force with fewer barriers and less expense uh, along the way. So we wanna encourage you to take advantage of all of the different ways that if you are interested in teaching, uh, you can do that in the state. That's really great. Um, thank you both for, for your, your answers. Um, I, I can't help but uh, be struck by how the, the things you're talking about describe a, a different education system uh, than what we, what we currently have. And, uh, and so it's just really amazing to hear all your ideas um, and the things that, that you would hope we can do um, coming out of this pandemic. Just going a little deeper, we're going to kind of go back now to short term sort of deeper um, um, issues, um, deeper learning, uh, sort of speak like there's there's a lot of fear out there um, that, that students have lost, um, you know, a year plus of, of education and um, there's a lot of concern, uh, particularly for for communities of color, low income communities. Um, uh, that they, they have been set back even further. Um, and I know both of you have, have been working really hard to think through what can the state do to partner with districts and, and, and communities um, to really take that issue on um, in the short term. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of your, your perspective on that and some of the things that you think, um, you, you, you think we need to focus on in this next uh, six to, to 18 months? Um, to try to try to help uh, students and Dr. Darling Hammond, your your framing of students are always learning is is really wonderful and um, it reminds me of the resiliency of our communities um, despite all the things they have coming at them. Um, yeah. So maybe we'll kick it off there and D Dr. Darling Hammond and then State Superintendent Thurman. Sure, yeah, and you know you think of all the people who've come to this country from war torn countries where they couldn't even you know access education. Uh, but we are learning beings. And when people get into a place where they're supported in their learning, you see how quickly uh, folks can, you know, quote, catch up, can, can move ahead. So we just need to understand that resilience, that, that learning uh, orientation is always there. And what do we know about learning that encourages it? First of all, as um, the superintendent said, the wraparound services that provide welfare uh, uh, and social emotional supports as well as health and other supports are critical because that's actually the base on which the learning happens. And so when we do that, we're actually encouraging academic progress. When we uh, enable kids to be socially and emotionally um, resilient and supported, we actually see academic gains from that. In addition, uh, there are ways that we can, um, we know the, for example, the virtue of high intensity tutoring uh, and how quickly people can accelerate when a, a caring person with knowledge and training works with them right where they are in their reading progress or their writing or their mathematics and gives them personal attention to, um, to improve. And so we will have resources going into that from the, uh, 
federal and state monies that are there for recovery. Uh, we want to be sure that teachers are well trained to understand what are the strongest strategies to um, enable kids to move forward. Really important that we not go in with that deficit framing, as I said, uh, and test kids and say, you know, you're smart, you're average, you're dumb, we're going to put you in three different tracks and label you and, and you know, then give you a different curriculum uh, in the low track, so to speak, because what we know is that actually depresses achievement in the long run. It's been particularly an issue for English learners in this state. In many cases where there's a sort of what people sometimes call the uh, ESL ghetto, where there's a set of courses where you can't actually um, access the college curriculum, for example, until you get out of those courses, or where your segregated kids learn language better when they are in groups of multilingual uh, learning. Uh, look at the international high schools, which is a network across the country. We have one in San Francisco. We have one in Oakland. Uh, where uh, kids who are newcomers at high school come in, work in a project-based environment without tracking, uh, learn the language and content and A through G curriculum mastery while they are um, being supported together uh, in a very productive way. You can go to the Learning Policy Institute website and see some profiles of how these schools do the work. Um, you know, Oakland International High School, which is also a community school with wraparound services, uh, graduates more than 90% of kids, most of them have completed A through G, and they do it in a way that builds on what the assets that students bring, and then skillfully helps them learn how to apply what they're learning in real life projects. So there are ways to do this. We want to spread that knowledge base so that uh, we're really lifting kids up and enabling them to use their minds well, not to sit in a drill and kill classroom you know, focused on multiple choice tests as the superintendent kind of flagged for us. That's a model of learning that we are trying to get beyond, but focusing on, you know, applying their knowledge in uh, productive ways with the support of caring and knowledgeable adults who see their value and who see their intelligence and who feed that every day. Hey, superintendent Thurman. I, I would, I, I echo what Dr. Darling Hammond has said, you know, uh, students are always learning. Um, there's never a time when we're not learning. And I, I, I know we have some educators who are on the Zoom today in the Hoke family. I wanna acknowledge how hard our educators have worked to lean in to make distance learning happen at a time when we didn't have anything else. Our, 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 our system literally moved into distance learning overnight. And we have to acknowledge our system wasn't built to deliver education in this way. And so without training and preparation, in order to keep our families safe, we moved into distance learning. And so that means that there have been some, uh, some impacts and uh, we have to work to offset them in all the ways that Dr. Darling Hammond talked about are right on point, the tutoring and the professional development, all these things are gonna make a difference. Um, I, I, but I also wanna acknowledge family engagement. What we do to help our districts connect with our families, our multilingual learners, uh, foster youth, uh, families, you know, you can't just tell a family, well, if you didn't get their information, just send us an email. We've got families who don't have access to computers. And I wanna thank you, uh, Max, and your role at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for supporting our work to build out family engagement strategies so, we, so our school districts can connect more directly to our families rather than expecting them to just navigate all these challenges all by themselves. And of course, you've supported our data strategies and our, you know, we're creating this great statewide youth advisory council. I, you know, I just have to acknowledge it that even as we, you know, look at 9,000 of our 10,000 schools are pretty much open or are almost reopened for in-person instruction, we are still seeing that there are high numbers of families that are saying that they'd still like to wait, that they still want to have distance learning. Uh, many of those are BIPOC families who probably lost a loved one to COVID or had some other impact. And so we have to work uh, with our families with trusted messengers to show that it can be safe to return with, with, you know, with uh, appropriate distance at schools and face masks and, and, and vaccinations and, and, and COVID testing. We, we can show our families that there is a pathway for a safe return for in-person instru instruction, but we're gonna have to work with our families who've been impacted in the greatest way by the pandemic. And I believe that slowly we will see them 
return so that as we get to the fall, that we will see that most families will wanna be in person, but there will be some families who will say, for whatever reason, I would prefer to stay in distance learning. And I believe that we have to accommodate them. Max, I wanted to close with this point on, on, on this segment that um, I know there's a lot of talent in the HOPE Network. And at the California Department of Education, we are constantly recruiting talent. And I'm seeing so many people, they're literally blowing up the chat about ideas and we want your ideas. And I wanna acknowledge uh, one of our deputy superintendents who was on today, who I brought on, Jenny Carrion, uh, who is here. Um, if you're interested in working at the Department of Education, you know, check out our website, there's hundreds of jobs. Talk with Jenny or myself. Uh, you know, for all of you who are, who are texting about your interest in multilingual learner programs, just know we have robust programs and we do have an opening for a key leader uh, who wants to work in that area. We have openings for people who wanna work in college and career um, transitions and, 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 and CTE. Uh, we have openings for people who have experience and wanna help lead great professional learning, professional development for educators. We're interested in hearing from you, um, you know, because as I understand it, HOPE is an organization that lifts up Latinas and you know, I want us to be supporting uh, that work, whether it be Latinas who wanna enter into politics, who wanna enter into the foundation world, who wanna become educators, or who wanna work in educational policy. Uh, whatever it is, let us know how we can be helpful to you. And uh, really great that you all have taken on this conversation about what we're doing to support Latina education uh, as we come out of the pandemic. Thank you so much for that. Um... Uh, and thank you for mentioning uh, Jenny Carrion among, among your, your various key staff, um, uh, a very um, accomplished Latina. We all know that uh, where anything good is happening, there's Latinas somewhere uh, along with black women doing really hard work. And so uh, uh, smart, smart of you, Superintendent Thurvid, um, to have such a great team. Um, we, we want to get to questions from the audience. They, as you can see from the chat, they are eager to, to engage you. Um, and, and so I just want to um, uh, transition us and really appreciate your comments and the work that both of you are doing on parent family engagement. Um, Dr. Darling Hammond talked earlier about that that's one of the things that has shifted in this pandemic is more communication with families and and. and and, um, and hopefully that's something that continues, a different sort of engagement, right? Um, and Superintendent Thurman, your work, um, uh, your vision around um, engaging community and, and family is so critical uh, to that. Um, so with that, uh, we're gonna have our first question actually from uh, HOPE's uh, policy director, uh, Vanessa Spagnoli, who also put in the chat, um, some of the reports that Dr. Darling Hammond's um, Institute, Learning Policy Institute have put out um, to guide um, leaders across the country around the recovery. Um, so check that out um, for those of you that are in the audience. Um, there's several links in the chat. Um, so we'll have our first Q&A question uh, from Vanessa and then we'll move to, to other uh, questions from the audience. Vanessa. Thank you, Max. Um, I'm feeling so optimistic for our education system, and that's a new feeling, so I just want to thank you all for the um, perspective, the expertise. It's been really incredible to witness. Um, my first my first question is, we talked earlier about LCFF and how it is constructed is intended to be an equity-based um, formula, really serving students that need it the most. Um, I'm curious to hear what policy changes um, might be needed to shift um, our current funding formula to be this new system, to make progress. So we'll, we'd love to hear what, what policy changes might be needed in the future. Uh, well, maybe I'll start off and um, Superintendent Thurman can add on. Uh, the, the LCFF is a good idea. It uh, you know, has been adding money to the system. We need to add more money to the system because we have to, whereas uh, the superintendent said, we are still not even at the halfway play, place uh, you know, in the ranking of states. Um, but the uh, count of weighted student formula gives extra money for English learners, for students living in poverty, for students living in foster care. Um, but it's not a very high percentage and they will only count each student once. So if you have a student 
who is an English learner living in poverty, who's also in foster care, they don't get like additional uh, weighting in the formula for all of the needs that may be represented by that. So we do need to continue to uh, leverage the formula to be more and more uh, focused on getting enough money to meet student needs, particularly of course in districts that have a lot of students um, where they need to you know, create the, the framework, the extra staffing that may be needed, the other support systems that may be needed to, to enable kids to achieve. So that's number one. Uh, another one is, uh, as both the superintendent and I said, is we need a, uh, an ongoing regularized way to provide these wraparound services. Uh, whether that's through community schools or through other strategies. Uh, right now it's a competitive grant program and you apply and you say, I need this, I want this, I'll get the money. We need to move that towards an expectation, uh, particularly for high poverty schools that, that those wraparound services are going to be provided and we're gonna enable that to be a sustained continuous thing. I could go on, but those are some of the things that I think are on the horizon for us. I, I, I echo Dr. Hammond about um, the importance of LCFF and how it gives us money to support uh, students who need additional support, um, but we can't stop there. And unfortunately, there was a measure on, uh, on the ballot last year in Prop 15 that would have reformed our tax structure as it relates to the amount of money that big corporations pay. Um, it would have reformed the historic Proposition 13, and it would have generated $8 billion for our schools. Um, every major research institution has said California needs to add billions of dollars um, for supporting the needs of our schools, including for the kind of mental health supports and wraparound supports that our students need. And so I think that we need overall and fundamental reform of our tax structure so that the large corporations in our state are paying more in a way that we protect working class and middle class folks. Everyone is already leveraging as much as they can. We can't ask any more of Californians, but there are big corporations that have had a, essentially a tax holiday from paying their fair share of property taxes for decades. We have to look at that. We have to look at the millionaires taxes. Um, you know, they say you show your value by what you put in your budget. And we always say our kids are number one. That means that we should fund them in a way where California is number one in per pupil spending, not, not in the mid to high 30s in, 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 of all states. Uh, we are the fifth wealthiest economy in the world. And uh, you know, uh, my goal is for us to, to charge to getting our kids to being number one in what we put into education funding for them. And one other point that we should keep in mind, we're on a path, but we have further to go. Uh, there got to be a point where we had increased the money that was going into corrections and incarceration and prisons by about 400% over a couple of decades while we were decreasing money going into education. And we were paying five times more for a young person who ended up in the prison system uh, as an inmate than we would pay for their education in Oakland or Compton or somewhere else where they you know, were not getting an adequate education. So talk about penny wise and pound foolish. I mean, that, that system has been very uh, unproductive and you know I, I have many adjectives, but I won't use them all right now. But somebody else asked about reducing uh, the school to prison pipeline. That is part of it and reforming that system so that we are not incarcerating people, we're educating them so that we are reducing the uh, abuses that have sent so many young people um, to jail so that in schools, we are not policing, but counseling. So we're using restorative practices um, so that we're really transforming that piece of the uh, system means we will also have more money to put into education. And this is sort of the win-win, sort of the virtuous cycle that we have to get into, uh, you know, which is, uh, transforming the vicious cycle that we have been in for actually several decades. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, we're just now gonna take questions from our, our Q&A box from uh, the audience. And um, I'm gonna combine two of the questions um, that I see. Um, oh, and I see Connie Leva is here. She's yeah. just uh, chatted us, so. Oh, great. Welcome, Senator Leva. <laughs> Um, glad you could join us. Um, so, uh, Carol, uh, Carol Padilla and, um, is asking about 
uh, the teaching profession and education, the education profession um, and the different roles and, and thoughts around um, bringing folks into the profession. Um, her specific question is around, you know, recruiting folks from other industries to come into education. Um, and the other question here is from Tracy Kalunga around diversity of that education profession, um, superintendents, teachers. And so I'm wondering, given the work that both of you um, have done on this and are doing now, um, what would you say about the specific things that you think need to happen and that you're doing um, to really focus on the profession and the, the teacher shortage, the diversity issues within our, our teacher and education profession? Maybe I'll have uh, Superintendent Thurman uh, followed by Dr. Darling Hammond. You know, I think people should just read the research that comes from the Learning Policy Institute. No one has said more about scholarships and residency programs and the kinds of things that will help to diversify the teacher workforce than Dr. Linda Darling Hammond. When I was in the legislature, I would just borrow her ideas and I would just put it into a, a legislative bill and just say, how do we get these funded? And um, uh, since she's become president every year, if you look at the state budget, there's been more and more money for scholarships and residency programs. Um, you know, this year, uh, our office is sponsoring a bill that would create, expand the pipeline of male educators of color who become teachers. Um, what we have heard from, from um, uh, educators of color and male educators of color in particular is that they experience microaggressions in the field um, that sometimes lead them to leave teaching. I say that to say that I believe that all of our educators uh, and candidates who want to become educators need to have mentorship and support um, to, and, and professional development to support them uh, in what's really become a very difficult time. If you want to become a superintendent, superintendents are under incredible pressure right now and school board members right now are feeling it. And so we have to have um, great mentors um, and, and folks who can um, support uh, our students uh, who want to become educators. Some of our districts have created grow your own programs where they work with students. And basically right now in San Diego County, there's a grow your own program that says um, you can essentially get a full scholarship if you choose uh, to become an, an educator. And so, um, you know, we've got work to do uh, in these areas, but we have to provide mentorship and support um, uh, because a lot of these are jobs that you don't really know about. Um, and so we have to provide exposure opportunities, learning opportunities, the, remove the barriers to be able to become an educator and then an administrator and a superintendent or a school board member. Um, and uh, we, you know, we've got great organizations that are uh, mentoring uh, school board members. We have the uh, California Latino School Boards Association. Uh, we, have, uh, we have affinity groups for both Latinx and African-Americans who are superintendents. Um, you know, so we have these opportunities. We just have to, uh, 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 do our work. I, I, I don't know if Shilonin is on here today, but she has served as uh, president of the California School Boards Association and is active with CABE. We have these great partnerships um, that we have to expand. Um, and of course, organizations like HOPE that provide the kind of mentoring um, that's going to support um, our future workforce uh, in the education world. And we, we welcome you and we're happy to work with you and support you. Hey, thank you, Dr. Darling Hammond. Well, all of that <laughs> and a bag of chips. I mean, it's really um, uh, doing, it's a multifaceted process to get the pathways open and the money in the places where uh, people can afford to become a teacher, right? So I would just note that with respect to career changers, teacher residencies were created with that in mind uh, because you can come in having already gotten your you know, college degree, maybe done something else and spend one year uh, get credentialed, get tutored, get mentored, get supported, and then, you know, uh, teach for the next several years in that district. There's also a classified uh, staff pathway to teaching, and there's resources for paraprofessionals who want to be on a pathway that underwrites their training to become teachers. So uh, finding those things is part of the challenge, and we are uh, hopefully going to soon have sort of a, a 
Point Central, where people can go and find the pathways for them that work for them uh, to become part of the teaching profession. We have a huge need. So I, yeah, I love the fact that um, Tony was recruiting everybody into the Department of Ed. That was great. I also want to just say, if, if you don't end up there, we want to recruit you into teaching uh, and into school leadership because the need is very great. The jobs are going to be there. The pathways are being opened up. Uh, and so uh, we should use this as a really uh, good on-ramp uh, for every aspect of uh, contributing to education. That's great. Um, and uh, as we close out the panel, I wanna combine uh, one question we always ask at the end of these panels. Um, and uh, one of the questions from the audience from Ver Veronica Miramontes, um, who's asking about the school to prison pipeline and what, what people can do to disrupt, continue to disrupt that pipeline so that um, our communities have equitable opportunities. Um, so as we close the panel today and, and this amazing conversation with you and, and discussion, um, we are at Latina Action Day. Uh, normally this would be in the state capitol um, with uh, thousands of Latinas storming the capitol, advocating for their community. Um, and so we're doing it in a virtual environment. Uh, but one of the questions we always ask is from our, our speakers at these events is how, what can the Latinas that are listening today and those that will view the, the video later um, do in their own roles where they are? And uh, HOPE represents women in all sorts of sectors, education, corporate, uh, elected officials, local and state and um, otherwise. Um, what, what can they do? What are the one or two things that you would, you know, recommend they, they do right away um, if they really want to disrupt the school to prison pipeline and, and take action? We'll start with uh, Dr. Darling Hammond and then maybe uh, end with Superintendent Thurman. Sure. Um, well, there's so much to be done. Um, and I think the ideas in the chat that are coming up are really good ideas. Um, you know, we have to uh, be sure that we're uh, training teachers and other staff in schools uh, to engage in anti-racist practice, to be um, culturally competent uh, in, in the work that they do. Uh, I mentioned earlier the importance of restorative practices. We used to have zero tolerance policies in California that actually required schools to expel students and to suspend them for certain things. And we've been moving over the last decade uh, away from what was a very uh, counterproductive approach toward uh, trying to hold kids in, you know, and teach them strategies for conflict resolution, strategies for, you know, uh, engaging collaboratively with others, opportunities to share what their experiences are in community circles that are part of a restorative practice uh, and ways to uh, reattach to the community whenever something is challenging uh, or problematic. And we see the results of these programs uh, in much stronger academic achievement, safety, belonging, graduation rates, every imaginable outcome is improved with these kinds of practices. So we need to encourage that. If you are a policymaker or a school board member or a, uh, in the system in some way, uh, and if you're a parent, you need to insist on it. Um, I had to do this for my own children. Uh, bringing uh, black children through the public school system was not an easy task. And I often had to confront exclusionary practices that were uh, in place in schools. Um, and I, I encourage every parent um, to know that your child should be uh, pulled in, accepted. There may be bumps in every road along the path to education, but never accept an exclusionary strategy as a productive way to deal with your child in the system. Uh, thank you, Max. Gracias, Max, and, and to Hope for having me on today. And uh, it's great to be on with Dr. Linda Darling-Ham. And I know you're gonna be in great hands uh, with Senator Leva, who chairs our education committee in the Senate and is a great friend to education and to the Latinx community. You know, I, I'm just, you know, I'm honored to be here today, uh, you know, first as the first Afro-Latino to serve in this role uh, since its creation. Uh, as someone who's raising uh, two daughters, raising two Latinas, this is a personal mission to me. 
Um, I, I appreciate the question about what we do to end uh, criminal justice reform, because for me growing up, you know, on the free lunch program and food stamps, I, I'm, I'm conscious uh, of where I could have ended up, but for education and for mentors who, who invested in me, who poured into me and said that your life will be different than it started. Um, and, and, and so it always comes back to education for me. Um, you know, the restorative justice programs, uh, we used Prop 47 to say, we're no longer gonna criminalize in this state, you know, small offenses. That has allowed us to save a lot of money that we have now transferred into these restorative justice programs. Our office has put out, put out more than $90 million in grants for restorative justice. There are more uh, grants on the way as we speak. Uh, and I know a lot of nonprofits are represented here today um, in, the, in the network that, that may wanna apply for those grants. But even beyond that, um, all the things that we've always known do make a difference. Um, you know, if you can volunteer to support young students and young readers, and this can be done through Zoom. I know my daughter is doing that right now, is working on tutoring programs in Oakland uh, to support young readers. They've always said, when our kids learn to read by third grade, they're less likely to drop out of school. And so I'm excited that this is, you know, uh, Latina Action Day. Uh, I hope that you'll support a bill that we're sponsoring. It's called AB 586. It actually will help school districts draw down more Medi-Cal dollars for more mental health services. Because our belief is that our schools need to have counselors, not police officers on campus, not those who would criminalize and arrest our kids, but our schools don't have enough money for it. And so that's why we're sponsoring AB 586, um, a bill that we believe can help to get more Medi-Cal dollars for nurses and counselors on our campuses. Do whatever you can. And thank you for continuing to be a part of the HOPE Network um, to make change. And thanks for having us on today. Thank you both so, so much. Um, this has been a really rich um, uh, conversation and panel. And um, I know how busy both of you are. And um, on behalf of HOPE and, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that supports HOPE, um, we're really grateful to partner with you as you tackle these very difficult, challenging issues in the, in the months and years ahead. And, and thank you for your leadership um, and your time. Um, good to see you uh, as well. And um, take care. Take care. Um, that was an amazing uh, conversation. And I hope that uh, everyone got a lot out of it. Um, I want to thank the audience for all the wonderful chat um, that we saw and also for your questions. I know we didn't get to all of them, but um, they covered a lot of ground. And so hopefully um, uh, some of that was helpful to you. Now I have the pleasure um, of uh, introducing Senator Connie Leva as I exit the stage. And um, just to say a few words about um, Senator Connie Leva. He represents the 20th Senate District. Good to see you, Senator. Um, and um, is taking her second term in the California State Senate. Um, the district that she represents includes the cities and communities of Bloomington, Chino, Colton, Fontana, Grand Terrace, Montclair, Moscoy, uh, Ontario, Pomona, Rialto, San Bernardino. Um, go IE, we're in yeah. the IE here. The Inland Empire's here. Uh, and Senator Leva has, has been extremely committed to issues around education, um, as well as other issues like the environment, economic development. Um, I won't name all of her accomplishments, but just on the education side, some of the bills that she's been able to get signed into law uh, relate to transparency in the charter network um, around the state career technical education um, at community colleges, SB 66, um, expanding um, career technical education course options for high school students, um, expanding educational services for homeless students, um, ensuring a stronger student voice. We talked about family voice and engagement. Um, she's worked on student voice in, in governing boards of school districts um, and, and allowing them to make informed decisions. Um, she serves as the chair of the Senate Education Committee. So no, no small feat, um, she's literally um, in a key role uh, for the state, along with uh, the two um, leaders we just heard from, um, really shepherding um, California's education policy. Um, lastly, let me just say, um, 
She's a longtime union organizer and uh, uh, supporter of workers' rights. Um, she served as uh, president of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Local 1428, um, helping grocery workers gain a stronger voice for wages and benefits. And first woman to be president of the California Labor Federation, representing over 2 million workers. And um, lastly, um, she was raised in Chino, uh, which is where my wife is from. So I have to put a plug in there. We know how great Chino is and good things come from Chino. Um, <laughs> And uh, Senator Leva lives in the Inland Empire with um, uh, her husband and uh, her, her children. Um, uh, she has two adult twin daughters. I'll let her talk about that if you'd like. And um, also uh, went to um, the same high school as my wife. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, Senator Leva, for, for joining us today and um, really appreciate your leadership. With that, I'll exit and hand it off to you. Thank you, Max. Thank you for that very generous introduction. And I did not know your wife was a fellow Chinoan. That is awesome. And I went to Don Lugo, so she's a fellow conquistador. I love That's it. Right. That's right. That's right. That is great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. And another fun fact is that your CEO, Helen Torres, is a resident of Senate District 20. So you know, here I'm gonna adjust my camera a little bit. So you know you have um, a great president. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Since being elected to the Senate in 2014, I've had many great conversations with Hope Latina Action Day participants. And I thank all of you for being here today. Uh, of course, most of these conversations happened in person in Sacramento, and hopefully we'll get to be able to do that again soon. So as you heard, as the chair of Senate Edu Education and the past chair of the California Legislative Women's Caucus, it is so great for me personally to join this amazing group of women um, that will continue to blaze trails as the years go by. As I'm sure many of you have heard, uh, this downturn the economy is being called a she session. See, she session. Hmm, say that five times fast. Uh, because women have suffered more than men have uh, economically through this uh, downturn in the economy. Even though as women we have made um, important progress in the workplace recently, uh, COVID-19 sadly hurt women, hurt us more uh, directly in many, many ways. Women are the primary income earners in many households. They influence the economy as workers, business owners owners, consumers, and decision makers, yet women in this state clearly face obstacles to enjoying economic security. Women are still paid less than their male counterparts for the same work in certain areas. Can you believe that? 2021 and this is still an issue? It just blows my mind, but we will keep moving forward until we fix that. And I know that all of you know statistically that Latinas make much less than white women, which is why each day we recognize equal, equal pay day until we get parity there as well. Women are also generally more likely to work in low wage jobs, live in poverty, and have fewer opportunities to advance in their careers. There, uh, these are among the many issues that I get to work on and will continue to work on, but it will require all of us working together to educate others and change the reality for girls and women in education, the workplace, and in society. It still boggles my mind. We have so much work to do, but that's okay. We're getting smarter every day. Uh, it may not happen overnight, but it will require fixing a system that oftentimes minimizes the role of girls and women, especially women of color. That is why I introduced SB 363, uh, Girl State. It, um, I, uh, it, this will finally ensure that young women attending Girl State have comparable program offerings as men attending Boy State. You may not know this because I did not know this. While young men in Boy State get to visit the Capitol and come to Sacramento, uh, the Girl State women, young women do not. While Girl State have to pay an, um, an application fee of $75, the boys do not. And the gender-based discrimination just continues to persist, which is why I'm fighting to change this reality and changing the the code and making sure that our young women are have access to civic engagement just like our young men. As a matter of fact, at the state capitol, there is a glaring example of the lack of historic representation, even with just the number of women serving in the legislature. Though I'm pleased to share that right now, the Women's Caucus, we have more women serving than ever before. 
38, which really is not a lot when you think that there are 120 legislators. The state is 50% female. So don't you think we should at least have 50% of the legislature? So we need to at least get to 60. We have work to do. So as of today, this is another fun fact, in the history of California, there have been a total of 4,457 people who have served in the legislature. 4,500 people, that's a lot of people. So I'm gonna give you one little quick second. How many of those do you think have been women over those years out of 4,457? 171, isn't that outrageous? That's only 4%. So if we women have served in the legislature, we all know our number. I'm number 45. So in the history of the state of California, I'm the 145th women, woman, 145th woman to be elected to the legislature. So clearly we have lots of work to do. And that's one of the reasons why I introduced uh, 363. We've got to get women up here. If you can't see it, you can't be it. Uh, here on Team Leva, we have authored almost 24 bills, almost two, two dozen bills this year. We're making up for lost time from uh, COVID where we just focused on uh, helping people eat, keeping people safe, finding PPE as we should have done. So a couple more bills that I introduced, SB 53, it will create legal protections for technology users when they receive unsolicited sexually explicit pictures known as cyber flashing. I did not even know this was a problem, but when I talked to my younger staff, they said, oh yeah, we get un inappropriate pictures of parts of people's bodies that we don't really want. So we are working on that. No more cyber flashing. SB 205, this will stop public school and community college employees, including teachers, from having to pay for the cost of a substitute while they are out on extended sick leave. So if you go out on sick leave, you actually have to pay for your substitute teacher out of your pay uh, while you're having a baby, while you're battling cancer. So we want to change that. SB 246, this is incredibly important. This will establish establish a single regionalized state reimbursement rate, the child care stabilization rate. We have lost so many child care centers, preschools, and we know that for anyone, especially women, to get back into the workforce, we need to have daycare for them. We need to have a safe place to leave your child so you can go to work, and we need to pay them properly. SB 299, that improves access to vital resources for victims of police violence as they recover from the physical and emotional injuries. Uh, this will make sure that if you have been a victim of police violence, you have access and we can use other ways than just the uh, police report, which could possibly be skewed to make sure that you get compensation from the California VCB. SB 309, I love this bill too. So A through G credits. When you were in high school, A through G um, classes are specific uh, English, uh, history, uh, math, science classes that you have to take. If you do not take those classes, you cannot get into a UC or a CSU. Who knew? 51% of students in California do not have access to A through G classes, mostly in communities of color. So we want to make sure that all of our students have the same access. This is about equity. SB 331, to prevent workers from being silenced because they were a victim of harassment or discrimination. This bill is also known as the Silence No More Act. Uh, we did a bill a couple years ago about sexual harassment and non-disclosure agreements, secret settlements. This will, bill would enable people who were racially discriminated against at work to not have to sign a secret settlement either. SB 523, expand and modernize birth control access in California to ensure greater contraceptive equity statewide, regardless of an individual's gender or insurance coverage status. Okay, I know that that's a lot of bills. Um, I just love my bills, but I know it's probably can be a little boring, but look out for those and uh, let us know if you have any questions. A recent report from the Governor's Council for Post-Secondary Education told us that since the start of this pandemic, over half of California's workforce with a high school degree or less has filed for unemployment compared to just 13% of those with a bachelor's degree or higher. So clearly, Education is one of those things that can help unlock more personally and financially secure futures, especially for women and women of color. That is exactly why I believe that AB, excuse me, SB 309, which will help with the A through G credits is so critically important. 
I want to talk to you a little bit about advocacy. Our work is not done, far from it, but we need people like you. We need you to get involved. You need, we need you to tell us what you like, what you don't like. Here at the Capitol now, even though you can't come in, we haven't opened back up, you can call in. So uh, I think access is actually greater than it's ever been. You can also call our district office. You can send us emails. Uh, we would love to hear from you. It's very, very important. As for my part in uh, advocacy, I will continue to develop and promote leadership programs for our youth, including young women, such as our Young Senators Program. We have Senate interns in our office, Young Women's Conference, and Young Men's Conferences. After all, equity does not happen in a vacuum. It requires persistence and hard work. Truth be told, the work that all of us do will benefit not just women today, but women in the future. And this is especially true for women of color. Creating a more culturally con culturally, culturally, sorry, culture. Um, conscious reality does not happen by chance. It takes a lot of work and a lot of effort and you have to be intentional about it. And that's what we all need to do. So consider all the tools at your disposal. Each one of us is different. Each one of us brings something different to the table and we need all of you. We need each and every one of you. On a final note, I will say that as women and as Latinas, it is incredibly important to prioritize yourself and self-care. We don't always do that. Before you embark on saving the world, be sure to take care of your physical and mental health, as well as personal wellness. Be kind to yourself and expect nothing less from others. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share a few words with you today. Have a great rest of your day and keep up the good work. Incredible. Thank you so much, Senator Leva. Um, your words were so inspirational and fitting given that our advocacy today is around SB 309. We share your love for this bill and expanding A through G courses exactly what is needed this year. Um, well, hello, Hope Advocates. Let's go ahead and transition to our advocacy piece. Um, our Hope staff is dropping the link in the chat and we get the chance to advocate for two bills today. Um, these two bills will expand educational opportunity for Latino students in two specific ways. I'm gonna go ahead and take a moment and share my screen so you can all see the tool that we're using. Much like the tool we used yesterday, you will have the opportunity to learn a little bit more about our bill and take action using this tool. On the left side, you'll see information about SB 309. As Senator Leva mentioned, this establishes a grant program intended to expand A through G completion. These courses are required for CSU and UC enrollment. So ensuring that more students have access to these courses is critical to widening the path to higher education. The second bill we are really excited to advocate for is AB 1456 by Assemblymember Medina. This reforms the Cal Grant Program and it expands access for many students who otherwise wouldn't have access. Um, this bill is all about modernizing the Cal Grant Program, um, which is overdue to say the least. On the right side here, you'll see Latinas Take Action, Education Equity for Latino Students. Please fill out this information and please use your home address, not your work address, so that it can it, it can generate your legislators. I'm here in Sacramento, so as you can see on my screen, my two legislators are Assemblymember Cooley and Senator Nielsen. I also want to point out this really important feature. You can tailor this box. So the first line says, as a constituent of your district please add your name and go ahead and customize. Why does this, this bill matter for you? Why does it matter to your community? This first email will be for SB 304 for Senator Leva, and you can customize it. Please add your name, your city, so that the office knows it's a constituent who is writing them today. That way it gets added to the official record. After you hit next, you'll have the opportunity to advocate for AB 1456 by Assembly Member Medina. This is access to financial aid. As we know, this is a huge 
barrier or it's a huge aid to Latino students in accessing higher education. By modernizing the Cal Grant program, we're widening that pathway to higher education, much like um, the recommendations from the panel today. Again, please add your name, add personal reasons. Why is financial aid important for Latino students? Why should this bill be passed today? And please customize this session. From there, you're welcome to hit submit, but I do wanna point out one final feature. At the bottom, you'll see these icons, Twitter, Facebook, email, to help amplify um, your advocacy on these specific bills on your personal channels. So we have direct advocacy in the box and we have social media advocacy, which is also really important. So if you click the Twitter, I hope this works, it should generate a tweet for you once you link your account and you can hit tweet. Your social media presence is really helpful and we wanna make sure that Latinas take action is loud and proud today. So the HOPE team is on standby. We're here to support, but thank you all for joining us. Um, I think we're actually running a little over time. So let me stop sharing. Um, the HOPE staff will be able to help in your in the chat. And Helen, I think I think I can bring it right to you. I'll welcome up Helen Torres, CEO of HOPE, to close us out. Great, thank you so much, Vanessa, and thank you for your leadership in putting to, together this incredible advocacy agenda on behalf of HOPE and the Latinas that we represent. I hope all of you were able to get um, so much more information on the work that we have to do to ensure education equity across the state. It's important for our economic realities as Latinas with an education, even if it's a two, as a two-year your um, associate degree can double your income. So please keep involved, keep engaged, take um, this time to ensure your legislators hear from you, specifically through the two bills that we're supporting around education reform. We'll be looking at the other bills that have been mentioned and keep you engaged on those and informed. At this time, I also, as you continue doing your advocacy, I also wanna thank all of you for participating in our second day of Latina Action Day. We're getting ready for our third one, which will be all around Latina representation and discussing specifically HOPE's priority bill, SB 702. So you'll wanna tune in tomorrow morning. A big thank you again to all the speakers, Senator Connie Leva, my Senator, as she indicated. Um, I'm very proud that she represents me in the State Senate. Um, State Superintendent Tony Thurman and Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond. This is an incredible, the both of them just are credible leaders. We're in such good hands in their leadership. And of course, to our good friend, I can't mention him enough and thank him enough, Max Espinoza from the Bill and Belinda Gates Foundation. I would also like to thank all the Latina Action Day sponsors and individuals that helped the organization put together this virtual event. Can't wait till we can do this all again to next year together at the state capitol. To our co-title sponsors, Amazon and Chevron, to our strategic sponsors, Wells Fargo and um, Southwest Airlines, our executive club sponsors, Comcast, NBC, Universal, Telemundo, Enterprise, Kaiser Permanente, SEIU California, Planned Parenthood California, Planned Parenthood Los Angeles, Orange County and San Bernardino County affiliates, and our state centered, um, state club sponsors, AT&T, Facebook, Marathon, Spectrum, Starbucks, and Valero. Thank you to all our great sponsors, and thank you again to you. A big shout out to our community affiliates for joining us and for getting the great numbers that we have been getting in participation. And if you signed up for the event on Zoom, you will receive a survey link via email. We truly appreciate your feedback, so we hope that we can you can take a couple of minutes to complete it. By filling out the evaluation, you are automatically entered to win an Estee Lauder gift basket valued at $200. So you have a great opportunity if you fill out that evaluation. We will be giving away five gift baskets. Um, when Latinas take actions, our communities are stronger. I encourage you all to continue staying involved, stay informed, and make your voice heard in the political process. Join HOPE as a member to receive policy updates, reports on the status of Latinas, 
and member-only leadership training opportunities. We'll be back again, as I mentioned, tomorrow at 9 a.m. for our third and final Latina Action Day session. You don't want um, to miss out an exciting lineup of powerhouse Latinas who are ready to discuss the importance of boldly investing in Latina leadership and representation. We'll be talking about HOPE's priority bill, as I mentioned, SB 702. So with that, look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you so much for your engagement and have a blessed and wonderful day. Take care.